Hey guys, this is Jay Calder with Jay Unboxing here talking about what we learned over the weekend. Solid weekend of fights, of course, to be honest. We started off with a bit of action over in England, a couple of shows over there in London. One seeing an odd ending between Zach Parker and John Ryder. The other seeing Gillian White get a decision win, if you want to call it that. Then we had the fight of the weekend, of course, in my opinion, which was the Regis Progre win over Jose Zapata to capture the vacant portion of the 140-pound title. So, lots to get into, not really any more time to waste. Let's dive into this and figure out what we learned. But before we get into it, if you want to know any of the details for these results, so on and so forth, methods, all that good stuff, check out jayunboxing.com and you'll have all of that over there. Be sure to check that out, and we'd love to hear what you guys learned down in the comments section below. Let me know what you guys kind of thought, your kind of pros and cons, and sort of who were the standout performers of the weekend as well. Let me know now in the comments section below. First things first, Regis Progre looks pitch perfect against Jose Zapata. Now, a bit of a disclaimer here to start this off. I actually thought Zapata would edge Progre in a very competitive fight, but to be honest with you, that didn't happen at all. Your boy can't pick him anymore as Progre definitely proved me wrong in that way. If you don't know, he actually picked up a 140-pound title by defeating Zapata by stoppage in the 11th frame after a fairly one-sided fight. I mean, there were some moments where Zapata had some success, but for the most part, it was one-sided. And in that respect, it was actually kind of a perfect performance because you didn't see Progre just blow him out in one or two frames and really not show anything. He got to show you the dimensions to his game. He had to show you that he can take a punch, he can dig deep, he can carry power late in a fight, all of the things you're looking for in a complete, well-rounded, well-balanced fighter. He showed you that on the night, and against a durable, credible opponent in Zapata. Now, detractors are going to look at this and say, well, Zapata's always fallen short at the very top, which is true to some degree. A lot of that was circumstantial. You know, he had his first world title opportunity and hurt his shoulder, and that's how he ends up losing that fight. Then he takes on Jose Ramirez, but it was a very close fight that he ultimately let go of down the stretch. This is the first time he has looked a level below the guy that he's in the ring, a level below at the very least. And Regis really put it on him. And just, again, especially down the stretch and just for large stretches of time in this fight. And now you have Josh Taylor rematching Jack Catterall to kind of settle once and for all who is the man at 140 pounds. But either way, if the winner inevitably stays at the division, they got to see Progre, either Taylor in a return or Catterall, because eventually this is just going to be the fight to make if Progre can comfortably make the weight. And if he could stay around for a while, while the likes of Teofimo Lopez get acclimated and Devin Haney potentially come up, then you're going to see some really interesting fights, even, of course, Javante Davis, some very good fights to be made, marketable names against a guy who now has a piece of the pie, so they're going to need to kind of negotiate with him, and it makes it a lot more of a wide-open 140 pounds. The one negative, of course, was that this was on pay-per-view, because this is a star-making performance. It's the sort of, you know, performance where a guy looks good against a credible name, decent fight, everything on the line in terms of a title, and he ends it, closes the show with a knockout. The issue is that because you put a price tag on fans' desire to see this fight, few Far fewer fans will have seen it than would have if it were on ESPN, for example. Likely, at least in terms of those that streamed it or downloaded it legally, you're talking probably south of 100,000 people, maybe in the 60,000, 70,000 range at most. That's just not good for developing a star fighter, unfortunately. But hopefully the word of mouth of the performance itself will do the trick, and going forward, you're going to see him in bigger fights, more meaningful fights, where fans will actually get to tune in and appreciate the work he put in. But... Kudos to Progre. Great fight, great performance, and now, once again, a big player at 140 pounds. And up next, Gillian White might just be about finished. Now, for those of you that don't know, one of the earlier fights for this Saturday was a heavyweight contest between White and Jermaine Franklin, which White did win via majority decision. However, some would also attach the word gift to that decision. Regardless of what you think of the decision, again, that's Unfortunate, but it is what it is if you think it should have gone one way versus the other. You don't just judge the fight, you judge the fighters. And what I mean by that is ultimately after the fight's done, you have to make a determination as to how good he looks for this division. The truth of the matter is that not only does it appear as though he might not be quite up to snuff against the likes of Usyk, for example, or Tyson Fury, whom he's already lost to, that just might not be in the cards. The fact of the matter is that that second tier of heavyweights, a guy like Andy Ruiz, probably beats him. And those up-and-coming guys 
the guys like a Jared Anderson or a Jalalov who we'll be getting into a little bit briefly, at least later on, those are guys that I would probably pick over White right now. I don't know White's age quite off the top of my head. probably should have looked it up, but I know he's in his 30s. He's not a young fighter. He's not really getting any better, necessarily. He's a sucker for an uppercut. Been stopped a few times, come short every time he's kind of near the top of the division, and now he's putting in rather pedestrian performances against a guy he's supposed to come back and look good against. That is not a good sign for him as, as it pertains to his prospects in the division. Now, on the plus side for him, of course, he is a name. He is a drawing star. He can still bring fans into an arena, and that does give him, again, as it did in this Franklin fight, perhaps a bit of an edge because he can always have that hometown decision in his favor, perhaps, and at the very least have the fans behind him, if he's to bring some of those names I mentioned, over to the UK. That being said, it's heavyweight boxing, and that doesn't always work out as well as planned because, quite frankly, a lot of times a single punch can change the night, and, again, White has been stopped in the past. A tough dude but a limited skilled fighter who's been knocked out before, has fallen short at the top, might just be that point where he's maybe looking to cash out at this point in his career. In any event, I'm sure he has a couple of fights lined up. There's apparently a rematch with Anthony Joshua that could be happening sometime next year, so of course we'll be on the lookout for that. But in any event, again, his time at the top might just be over. And finally, could Canelo Alvarez really face John Ryder next? And I know this is supposed to be what we learned, but I, I think we've learned enough to at least ask this question. I do think it's a reasonable fight that could potentially happen based upon the circumstances here. Again, briefly, in case you missed it, John Ryder upset Zach Parker, earning a mandatory position for one of the many titles Canelo Alvarez possesses, meaning he should be next in line to get a title shot. However, this is boxing. Not everything is so perfect and pretty that way, so you just never know. However, Canelo is coming back from an injury has said that he's looking for maybe a softer touch, a tune-up, before he faces Dimitri Bivol in a rematch later in 2023. At the same time, Eddie Hearn, a promoter that works close with Canelo, has said that the fighter is looking to fight maybe more internationally in the coming fights, because that's sort of ground he hasn't quite yet tapped into. Again, a fight with Ryder could be staged in the United Kingdom at some point, some place, perhaps in England, of course, and that would be a fight that I think has a great deal of sellability in that part of the country, or the part of the world, rather, because, again, you're seeing Canelo against a hometown guy, why wouldn't you? What's more, with all due respect to Ryder, while he's a tough guy and certainly has his own skills, he is a softer touch that maybe Canelo's looking to get right against in maybe May of next year, so it's a fight that actually could happen, that could sell, based upon where the, the sort of geography of the fight is, and would serve its purpose, get a mandatory out of the way, get Canelo to kind of shake off some rust, get a confidence booster going, and then move back into that Bivol return. Again, nothing set in stone, but it's a possibility there, and kind of one that if you had said it a year or two ago, probably wouldn't have believed it. But here we are, we literally could be on its doorstep, so just an interesting thought or observation that I had. And some quick hits here. Parker, as I mentioned, ultimately got injured in that fight with Ryder, and apparently broke his hand or hurt it severely, and had to withdraw himself from the fight after the fourth frame. He's going to need to rebuild for sure. A skilled fighter, but... This is not always a great sign. Hopefully he's not injury prone. Hopefully he's not looking for ways out, That's as some might have suggested. In any event, a skilled fighter, so hopefully he can recoup and get better and get back to it after the hand heals. And as I mentioned, Bakador Jalilov is a problem at heavyweight. I think he's going to be a really good fighter. He's under 30, can punch, moves around pretty athletically, isn't afraid of actually getting into a fight, but is still very technical. Gold medalist, so he knows what he's doing in the ring as well. Definitely going to be a problem in the heavyweight division, in my opinion. Also, just a quick note there, there was a fun war between Fabio Wardley versus Nathan Gorman. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a short fight, but worth it at heavyweight. Definitely went out guns blazing, both of them. So, yeah, deserves a shout. You should check that fight out. And let me know what you guys kind of learned over this weekend, what you thought about it, what were your favorite fights, who do you think stood out as the performer of the weekend, Regis Progray, obviously. Love to hear all that down in the comments section below. Please be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter at jcaldron underscore job. You can email me at jayunboxing at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you there. Also, check out jayunboxing.com for schedule, results, betting odds, rankings, all that stuff. And as always, until next time.